Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this series on creating SSH keys and applying them to cloud instances. In today's video, we're going to create a AWS instance and apply our keys to that instance. So let's begin. So in our previous videos, we created our SSH key pairs. However, in this video, I'm going to create a brand new key pair because for security reasons, I want to have a dedicated SSH key pair versus sharing an SSH key pair with other instances that I have up. Because if somebody gets a hold of this key pair for any reason, then everything is compromised and I'd have to go around changing everything. And I'd rather just have a separate key pair for each instance that I bring up. So let's go ahead and create our SSH key pair for this particular AWS instance. I'm not gonna go into details on what's going on as I create them. I will do general description. However, if you want the details, please go back to the previous videos to remind yourselves. So let's go. I'm opening up a 2004 shell for Ubuntu 2004. I'm going to go ahead and maximize it and grow it a little bit so we can see. Quick reminder, Apple users, you will probably wind up finding your SSH keys in this directory here, local. Just the second you open up the terminal, you'll be in your home directory, and that's where it will be. For Ubuntu users and other Linux users, it might show up in your .ssh. Since I'm on Ubuntu, I'm going to go into the hidden .ssh directory. I'll do a directory listing, which is an ls minus l. And you can see the keys that I had for the previous video. Quick point here, these keys, if I came back and I hadn't worked with them in a while, especially if I'm not in an enterprise and I'm a solo user, I might not remember what the purpose of these keys are. So make sure you keep track of this by either taking notes or by some other system that you might have. Also, if you do take notes, especially if you're doing keys, make sure you save them in a password security program or other that keeps them safe and encrypted. I'll clear the screen and I'm gonna do an SSH key gen and I'm gonna choose a 4096 sized bit key. When I hit enter, it's going to ask me for the name. And this is where, again, I had spoken about naming it something so that you know what it's for. For me, I'm just gonna go ahead and say AWS RSA. Now again, make sure this is descriptive for yourself. And when I hit enter, it's gonna ask me for a passphrase. I have my little notes file here, and I already put in an SSH key pair name of ID underscore AWS RSA because I prepared the, this previously. And I generated a randomized password. This randomized password is just anything that I created. Um, just make sure that it's long enough and complex enough you, and does not use any like real words such as, you know, love or anything like that in there. So I, I'm gonna copy this into my clipboard. I'm gonna come down here in the file and paste it just to make sure that it's in my clipboard. Because if you look at this here, when I right click to paste it in, the keyboard is not gonna react, the cursor is not gonna react, you're not gonna see anything and you're gonna think that nothing is working, but it is. So I just hit enter, it's gonna ask me for the passphrase again. I right click, absolutely no reaction. I hit enter again and I get my random art image for the key pair that I just created. If I clear the screen and do an LS minus L, I see that I have this ID underscore AWS RSA and the dot pub, which is my key pair. And we're ready to continue to create our AWS instance. Okay, so let's minimize our screen and we're gonna open up a web browser and go to aws.amazon.com. Here on the right side, you'll see create an AWS account. Click on there and go ahead and fill in all your information, create your account, enter your credit card information, um, I'm not gonna go into that here. I don't think it's necessary. 
and understand though that there's a free tier element to AWS that allows you to play around and learn their system. So take advantage of that um, if you so desire, because it's a terrific uh, tool that they offer. Uh, for us though today, be aware that I'm gonna be creating an a1.xlarge instance, and it does cost money to run this instance, but it's what I need in order to run the node that I'm gonna finally create from this instance. Now your screen might not look like mine, however, the nav bar at the top should be the same. So inside the nav bar at the top, so I'll go ahead and I'll type in EC2, which is your Elastic Compute Cloud. That's what it stands for. And I'm gonna choose the virtual service in the cloud. This is an EC2 instance is an actual instance in the cloud. So I'll click on that. And now you should wind up at a screen similar to mine. If yours looks different, I'm using this new EC2 experience. So you can choose that if you're an experienced user and you don't want to, that's fine. That's just personal preference. So before we actually go about launching our instance, we want to import our key. That way we have a key, a SSH key, to apply to our instance for access purposes. So what we're going to do is we can either click on key pairs here from our resources menu, or on the left side, nav, you can go down to network and security and click on key pairs. Now I have a key pair already in here, but yours might be empty. What we'll do is we'll go to the Actions dropdown and choose Import Key. At this point, we'll have fields here where we can fill in our key and give it a name. But for Windows and Apple users, you can click the Browse and go look for your public key. Just make sure that you choose your public key. The other option is to paste it in, which is what I'm going to do for this lesson. So I'll bring back up the Windows subsystem command prompt that I had when I created the key pair originally. And I'm going to issue a cat against ID AWS RSA .pub. And when I hit enter, I will receive my full public key. I can highlight everything. In order to copy it into my clipboard here, I just hit enter. Uh, you might have other options such as command C, Control C, uh, right click and copy, et cetera. So find the one that will put it into your clipboard. Then we can go back and we can paste it in. Now, one of somebody had mentioned to me earlier, hey, what about this comment down here at the bottom? This where it shows my laptop and a name and my name, et cetera. So if I had my full name here and it's a public key and it could be seen by public, maybe I don't want this comment here. So you can just get rid of it. You don't need it. Just make sure you have the double equal signs afterwards. I'm gonna now go to the top. I'm gonna name it the same name that I named my key from over here. And that's ID AWS RSA. and then just import key. And now I have my key imported and we're ready to move on to the actual creation of our instance. So I'll click on the EC2 dashboard and bring myself back to the main screen. So I'm gonna click on instances and it's filtering here on instances equal running. I'll just X that out, it doesn't really matter. Uh, just to show you that I have nothing running in this region right now. And I am in the Ohio region. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose to launch an instance. From here, I can scroll down a little bit and find my Ubuntu 2004, which is the instance that I wanna run. Another option that you have is to go into the search and you can choose Ubuntu and if you hit enter, it'll just filter out just the Ubuntu servers that you have. And there's several deep types of servers that you can choose. The first image, which is the AMI, um, Amazon machine image, is the one that we want, 20.04. And I'm gonna choose 64-bit uh, ARM is what I want. And I'm gonna choose select. It's gonna bring me to a new screen where it's gonna show me all the different instance types that I could use to run this, but I know exactly what I want, so I don't wanna sit here and filter through it. I'll click on 
all families and then choose A1 because we want an A1 extra large for this particular video series. When I do that, I get an A1 extra large right here, which gives me four CPUs and eight gigs of memory or virtual CPUs. I select that and then I'll go ahead and continue the configuration. But I'm going to stop right here. Some of you might have realized, wait a second, I can't find an A1 instance and I'm in my region closest to me. What do I do? Well, the A1 extra large might not be available in all regions. So up here on the right at the top, you can click on the region that you're on and you can choose another region. So go through the regions and find a region that has your instance that's closest to you. The only reason why I use the term closest to you is it will reduce the latency from when your local system accessing your remote system. It has nothing to do with the ability of your machine to work on the internet. So you can choose whatever region you want. It's not, there is no uh, preference there, as long as it has the A1 extra large in it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and click on the next configure instance details. And if I uh, move myself out of the way, you can see the button is kind of underneath me. You know, I think what I'm gonna do is uh, move myself completely out of the way for the remainder of this section because the buttons underneath me are needed. Um, on this screen, we're gonna go ahead and take the auto assign public IP address. It's the only setting that we're gonna change. Now it's enabled, we wanna disable it. Reason being is if this instance gets restarted or just stopped and started later on, your IP address, your public facing IP address will change. And that's not conducive for our purposes. We need a static IP address. That's all we need to change here. And the next thing I'm gonna do is click on the add storage, which is our next element. What we wanna change here is our size of our hard drive. So we wanna change that to 160 gig. Now I'm gonna skip the rest of the configuration uh, details and go immediately to review and launch because we'll get back to the additional steps of the additional elements that we want to add to this instance later on. But for now, let's review and launch. When we do that, we'll get a couple of warning messages. The first warning message is saying, hey, you don't have any security groups set up. Be careful. But we're okay with this for right now because this particular setup is ephemeral and we're going to lock it down nicely uh, throughout the rest of this video. The second warning is telling us, hey, this is going to cost a little money. And we already knew that, so we're good there. So we can just go ahead and launch. And I know that my launch key is a little bit off the screen here, but I'll click on the launch. And up comes security keys. Right before we started to create this instance, we added our RSA key. If I click the down arrow here, a list of all my keys will come up. But for our purposes, you probably only have one key here unless you're an advanced user. So just make sure you select the key that is the ID AWS RSA key or the name that you named it. You'll acknowledge that if you lose this, then you're gonna lose access to your system and you're kind of on your own, and then you can launch the instance. So I'll go ahead and launch. And our instance is launched. If I click on the instance name, I'll see that my instance is up and it's already running, being that it's a nice system, came up really fast, so that's good. Our next step is to assign that public IP address that we had disabled when we were creating the instance because we didn't want it to be dynamically changing every time we started and stopped. So on the left side nav menu, we'll go down to under network and security, elastic IPs, select elastic IPs, allocate elastic IP address. Here, we're going to make sure that the Amazon pool of IP4 addresses is selected, the others are ghosted out, and we can just allocate. Now, you'll notice um, that this kind of changed on me. I used to actually ask you uh, to make sure, you know, what region you wanted to allocate. So I assume 
now they automatically allocate it for the region you have selected, which for us is Ohio. So I go down and I click the allocate. And I have an IP address that has been allocated. Now we got to associate this IP address with our instance. Important to note here that you are charged separately for an elastic IP address. If you shut your node down, you'll still be charged for your EIP. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the actions and associate elastic IP address. That'll bring up this screen. I choose instance and I'm going to allocate it to the instance that we just created. Now I only have one instance, but if you have multiple instances, you'll need to make sure that you select the proper instance that you can get from the dashboard. I click on the choose a private IP address. This is the internal IP address. And it's okay to just select whatever it, it auto populates for us there, not a problem. And then I'm done here and I associate. Now we have a elastic IP address so that we have a permanent IP address, our instances associated to that IP address, and we can continue with our configuration of our instance. What we'll do is we can go back to our dashboard. It's sort of the easiest way. Click on our instances, and I see that I have my instance here that's running, and I'm going to select it by clicking on the link. Now, inside the link, I'm going to go down to security, and then I'm going to move down a little bit further to my security group that's been created for me that's showing that currently the only thing that's allowed is port 22. So let's click on that and bring up our security group. And then we're going to click on edit inbound rules. Now here we have a situation where our inbound rules, let's see if I can bring that down just a little bit. Our inbound rules currently are set up so that if I attempt to do a secure shell, which is the whole point of this series, into this particular instance, it says that everybody on the internet, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, is allowed to access port 22. And that's not good for security purposes, especially when we're dealing with going to be doing cryptocurrency elements and maybe I have a wallet sitting on this instance. I don't want people to be able to just randomly attempt to access it and they can try brute force attacks and all different sorts of ways of accessing my system because I have this port open to everybody. I don't want to do that. So what I suggest is to restrict this down to only the IP addresses that you are associated to on the other side of the connection, which is at your home or your office, understand that a lot of home users have dynamic IP addresses that change. So from time to time, you might try and access the system and not be able to access it and forget that the reason why is because your home IP has changed, but you're allowing the old IP into your system. So you have to you know, be under the habit of coming back to this firewall settings or the security group and changing and updating. Now, ways to go around this are to purchase static IP addresses from your internet service providers, your ISP, or you can do a VPN service that offers you static IPs and several other methods and other ways that are more advanced that I'm not going to get into here. But what I want you to do is X that out so that it's not there anymore. And we're going to go to www.whatismyip.com. And here, right in the center, is the IPv4 address that we're concerned about, that we want to find out that we hold from our ISP. The IPv6, for the purposes of this video, we're not going to get into. Um, right now, we're just going to utilize IPv4. And that'll be good enough to get us going and get us working. So we want to write that down. So what you want to do is click on the copy 
And if you bring up your notes, you can add it to your notes as um, your local IP address. And we do need to add our, our um, EIP address here as well. We'll do that in a second. So coming back to the console, I can click in the search and I can paste the IP address that I found into the box. And you'll notice the slash 32 at the end for the sitter block that was added. Now, sitter stands for classless interdomain routing, but it's just basically routing stuff over the internet, you know, how you get from point A to point B. And in the sitter blocks, you tell it what you care about. This is a 32-bit address, so we care about all 32 bits of this address. We want to make sure that it has to be exactly this IP address. So we make sure that we have that slash 32 added in, select it, try it again, and select it. And it'll show up at the bottom, and we're good there. And we want to now add our other rules. These other rules, in this particular case, are for getting my node up and running for um, Constellation and, uh, but for users who are not watching this for that purpose, you'll add all the other rules that you need, such as maybe HTTP, HTTPS uh, in there. But for us, I'm gonna add the rules that are necessary for my particular node that I'm creating. So I'm gonna click on the add rule, that's going to be a custom rule, TCP, and I'm going to choose ports 9000 through 9001. And for that, I want to allow every address, and I don't care about any of the bits of them. That's that slash zero. I'm going to add another rule. This is going to be a custom rule, and it's going to be port 9002. And this is going to be, again, my specific IP address because this port is going to open up a, a web browser interface for my node itself. And I only want myself to be able to access this. I don't want the public seeing this. And then I'm going to add one more rule, and it's going to be 9003. And I'm going to allow everybody into this. So 9000 through 9001 and 9003 will be open full access port 22 and port 9002 will be closed access. And then I save the rules. And now I have a security group set up with the correct rules in there. And you can see that they're all listed here and you can go and you can see the details as you go across. Now, our outbound rules are just wide open. That's because as long as it's established from inside the node and outbound, I'm going to allow it because I need to be able to go out to the internet and do various things. Okay, so now I have my instance up and running. I have my security group set up and I've locked down SSH access to only myself for my local network at my office so that I can't access it any other way. I have the proper ports open for my particular use case. And I have an elastic IP attached to my, my instance so that it doesn't change over time. And that said, we forgot to do that. If you see here on the public, what I did was from the instances, I clicked on the link for the instances and up came some details about my instance and one of them is the public IP address. If I copy that, bring up this and pop it in, now I have all the information that I need to access my node and I'll minimize that. And let's go ahead and try and access our new instance in AW. So it's important to note here that the next video in the series, I don't use the same credentials because I created the node for DigitalOcean and I changed everything. So please be aware of that. My notes might change in the next video. 
However, everything applies. You're going to use your local IP address, your, your EIP address as your public IP address, and your SSH key. That will conclude this video. I want to thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.